Hi guys, this video is about patella tendinopathy and basically what causes it and what you can do to get it better. I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail, especially where the exercise is concerned. I would say if you've not watched this video before, do try to watch it from the beginning to the end because it's really important that you understand how long this condition takes to get better and what it needs to get better because otherwise people's expectations may be wrong and they actually don't fully engage with rehab. You'll get the most out of your rehab if you fully understand this condition. But if you just want to jump to the sections that I'm going to discuss, I've put links in the description of this video where you can jump to certain timelines for treatment, for instance, or if you need a scan, things like that, the different sections. So have a look at that. Now, the things I'm going to cover is I'm going to look at what causes patella tendinopathy. Secondly, what happens in the tendon when you develop this condition? We're going to look at how can you tell if it's patella tendinopathy, because there are other conditions that can feel very similar to this. Um, and whether you need a scan or not, then I'm also going to discuss what other conditions can feel similar to this and how you can know whether they are involved or not, because you can get a combination of things. Um, then we're going to touch on how long, long does this type of condition take to recover. And then we'll get to the exciting bit, the treatments and treatment options for it, where I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail with regards to exercises and the stages of treatment with regards to that. And then finally, we'll take a look at several reasons why your um, patella tendinopathy is not getting better. So feel free to ask questions as we go, as I go along, or if you're watching this on replay, please ask questions um, in the comments of this video. Excellent. So my name is Mareka, if you've not met me before. I'm the physiotherapist from um, sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for injuries. So have a look at the description of this video if you want a link to my website. And if you need more help with your injury, I can always help you via video call. Excellent, so let's dive right in. What causes patella tendinopathy to start? So like all tendinopathies, it's an overuse injury. So it's when you work the patella tendon harder than what it can actually adapt for or that it can stomach. And it's often to do with not actually allowing it enough recovery time after exercise bouts. So activities that specifically load the patella tendon is um, jumping activities. So if we think of basketball, um, long jump, high jump, um, but then also sprinting activities, forceful stopping, those type of activities as well and um, strength training, so deep squatting, um, crossfit type activities, all of those things that kind of squat movements, jumping movements, um, fast running things, they load the patella tendon are most common reasons why this um, injury happens. You can get it from a direct blow to your tendon, so if something knocks you right on the tendon as well, um, but that's not so common. If that's happened and is the reason for your tendinopathy, then it's a good idea to have other um, structures also checked because when you get trauma like that, you can often irritate other things as well. But I talk a little bit about that more in a minute. Um, so what happens in the tendon when you develop patella tendinopathy? Tendons are extremely strong structures and they are made up mostly of collagen fibers and the collagen fibers are all um, in parallel with each other. So I like to use the analogy of if you think of one piece of string, it's quite easy to break. But if you've got several pieces of string next to each other in parallel, you really struggle to break it and you, you actually can't. So that's what makes the tendon so strong. You also have little cells um, in different parts of it. And you've got ground substance between the fibers, but not a lot of it. Now, when you injure your tendon and it um, develops a tendinopathy, these fibers get pushed away from each other a little bit. and You get more of the ground substance in between. You also get that your the cells change shape and you've got more of them in there. Um, and in essence, what happens is because the fibers now move away from each other, your tendon becomes softer. When we talk about tendons, stiffer tendons are stronger and better at returning forces. Softer tendons 
are not so good. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing, if you looked on an ultrasound scanner, you could see a thickening in the tendon and you may even see little blood vessels growing into it, which you don't normally see in a healthy tendon. So all in all, the result of a tendinopathy is that you get a slightly weaker tendon, um, which is softer and it doesn't return energy so well and it becomes a painful tendon. Now, while I'm thinking about it, I may just add this in here. You may have been told that because your tendon is softer, it can easily tear. It is really uncommon, it is not a common occurrence for um, patella tendinopathy tendons to rupture by themselves. So please don't worry about it. Your risk is very low. And if you follow the correct treatment plan, it's really, really low risk. Okay, so don't worry about that. So how do you know if you've got patella tendinopathy? The first thing is that the pain is over the front of the knee. And it's usually, you can get patella tendinopathy in three places. So let me show on my knee if I can show my knee here. There we go. So if you get the bottom of your kneecap, Actually, if I do this, maybe that's better. And maybe if I don't quite bend it so much. I'm going to take this thing away for a moment because I think it's in our way here. There we go. Okay, so that's my kneecap. You can see the bottom part of the kneecap. The patella tendon runs from the bottom of the kneecap down the front. So if I turn my knee like this, down the front and attaches to the tibial tuberosity there. Now, the most common place for people to get this type of tendinopathy is where the tendon attaches to the lower point of the kneecap and that's often where you feel the pain as well it's very specific to this inferior pole of the kneecap if you've had a direct blow or if you, you've got a mid portion tendinopathy you can get pain there and if you've got the tendinopathy at the insertion here the tibial tuberosity you can feel the pain there but the pain is very well located to the tendon it's not all over the knee and it's not a diffuse pain kind of there or there it's very much on the tendon and if you prod the painful bit that's usually where the pain is produced as well um, the pain is most commonly there when you do tendon loading sports or activities so for instance if you do deep squats or you do jumping activities or um, running activities it's not commonly there with rest although if you sit for long periods of time that can often make it hurt as well and that's because there's a low level of stretch and compression on the tendon there um, what else oh yes often you'll feel the pain when you start the load bearing activity so like when you start running or jumping but then the pain goes away but it comes back worse several hours later and often the next day it can feel a lot more tender that's a typical pattern for a tendinopathy um, what am I forgetting here? Oh yes, it's really not a condition that is associated with swelling of the knee. Swelling of the knee tends to more indicate that you've got um, either something injured inside your knee joint or if it's a very kind of local swelling over the front, it may even be your fat pad or it may be a bursa or something that's inflamed and sore there. So. Those are the main things that tells you, or symptoms that tells you it's a tendinopathy. But also, if you go and see a clinician about this, they will be able to combine those signs with what you tell them in the history. So how you developed your injury, how the pain reacts when you do certain things. All of that is combined to make a diagnosis because there are other things that can give you pain over the front, and I'll tell you about them in a minute. But first, let's discuss, do you actually need a scan to diagnose this? Short answer is no. Ultrasound scans can show up a tendinopathy, but the problem with ultrasound scans is that we get tendinopathy signs even in people who don't have pain in their tendons. So just because you've got a bit of thickening in the tendon and stuff doesn't mean that you've got a dysfunctional tendon that is causing you pain. It can still be coming from other places. But scans can be useful if there's a bit of a mixed picture and you need to rule things in or out, so for instance, if you want to see if the bursa is inflamed or the fat pad may be an issue, or um, does the tendon have any pathology in it. So scans is not necessarily needed, but it can be useful if you're struggling to make the diagnosis or you're just querying if you're on the right track. <clears throat> 
Then what other conditions can feel similar? So patellofemoral syndrome, which is pain in the kneecap, can cause pain over the front of the knee. But usually that pain is kind of around the kneecap and it moves around a little bit. Um, you can have it under the knee, the, the knee, but you'll find at different stages of the day, you may feel it in different places and it may feel deep behind the kneecap. Then you've got a little fat pad just um, below the kneecap and underneath the tendon and that can cause a lot of pain but usually that pain is caused more with activities where you extend your knee fully so that's why it's important that the therapist really listens to when your pain happens and what activities because all of those things rings a bell as to we need to exclude this condition or no it's definitely more this condition um, then another one is if you've got a tendinopathy where it attaches to the tibial tuberosity they can often go hand in hand with irritation of the bursa as well. And you can have both of them at the same time. So in that case, it may be useful to have a scan because bursas can actually react quite well to um, injections if they don't um, react to conservative treatment. Oh, uh, what else? Oh yes, if you've injured your cartilage of the kneecap or of the tibia, um, of the trochlea where the, where the kneecap, the little groove that the kneecap moves in, that can cause pain in that area. So again, it's about the mechanism of injury and how the symptoms react. So how long does recovery take for patella tendinopathy? I'm afraid you're not going to like this answer, but what the research is showing is that less than 50% of people with this condition returns to their full sport within one year. So 12 months after developing their condition, 50% of people tend to not yet be at the level where they can take full sport, sporting activities again. But 50% of people can, okay? So don't get totally despondent about this. This does not mean that these, the rest of the 50% are in constant pain. It just means that they're not at that level yet where they're fully ready for sport. Why is this? Because actually the body does take much, much longer to repair certain um, injuries than what we expect. And I find that often the problem is that my patients expect them to be better within two, three weeks. And that's just not how the body works. What I can say is if you can get this treated earlier rather than later, so that your pain hasn't go, gone on for a very long time, it is often easier to calm it down more quickly. So make sure that you seek advice quickly after you develop these symptoms. Good. So let's move on to treatments. Now, what treatments work for this? There's a combination of things. It's again, not a one size fits all. And I'll discuss quite a few things. We're gonna um, look at exercise specific for the patella tendon, but then we're also gonna look at the rest of the body because you can't just address the injury site. You need to look at why this condition has developed. Um, <clears throat> relative rest and load management is the most important thing. And we're gonna use relative rest and load management through even while we do the strength training for this condition. What do I mean with load management? So when you injure your tendon, before you injure it, it has the capacity and strength to cope with a certain amount of load. So a certain amount of jumping and running and all of those activities is the load you put through it. But as soon as you injure it, its strength and capacity to cope with that load decreases. So where you could do that much without causing yourself pain, you can only do this much now that it's injured. If you continuously try to do this much load on it, you'll just keep on aggravating the symptoms and your symptoms will get worse. But if you can reduce your load to a level where it's just mildly irritated and you don't really cause an increase in your symptoms, that is the level we want to be working at because then we can start repairing this tendon and strengthening everything else up so that you can get better. Okay, so load managers, management is the first important bit. And to be honest, it can be a bit overwhelming to figure out what on earth that means for you. It's really useful to speak to somebody who is experienced in this to help you decide what amount of load and activities, sporting activities as well as outside of that, is the right amount for you. Now, another thing that's um, useful, and there's a really good research article that I'll show you the link to in a, or the um, description of in a minute, where <clears throat> they, 
They advocate Peter Maleris, I can never say his surname, um, is a tendon specialist in from the UK and I think I've just made him the UK. I don't know if he's actually Australian now. Just confused. I think he's Australian actually. Um, and they wrote an article about patellar tendinopathy and they use a pain provocation test to see if their exercises and activity levels are at the right level. And it's quite clever because what you do is you find an activity that is uncomfortable for your tendon to do. The activity they use is a single leg squat on a decline board and you notice how much it hurts. So you decide, you do it and you decide, okay, that feels like about a six out of 10 pain when I do this movement. Now you don't do that as an exercise. That's just a test you do to see if you're improving or not. Okay, so keep that in mind. Actually, I've just remembered, I've got a picture of that. Um, if it wants to show itself. There we go. That's a guy doing a single leg squat on a decline board. And there's the reference for the um, article. It's in the Journal of Orthopedic uh, Sports Physical Therapy, where you can find it, 2015. And it's patella tendinopathy. So that is a test that you can do to see how uncomfortable it feels for your tendon. That may not be uncomfortable for everybody's tendon. Some people may find that different movements is uncomfortable, but you need something that you can test to know if your tendon's getting better or not. Um, okay, so the important thing of this test is that you do it every day after you've done a training session or um, at the same time of day. And you're gonna use it to decide if the previous day's training was at the right level or not. So say for instance, you get up in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning, you do this test and you always keep the circumstances the same and you rate it out of 10, where 10 is the worst pain you can have and zero is no pain. And then over time, we don't expect it to improve day on day on day. It'll be amazing if it does, but actually you may only see tiny improvements. Also, I'm quite happy with it if it just stays at the same level, because that means the exercise we're doing is not aggravating your injury. It's just keeping it the same. Okay, so that's what we're aiming for. We don't need to see improvements at this stage. You'll see improvements over several weeks. But day to day, we just want to see the pain levels to stay pretty much at the same level. Okay. So that brings us on to then exercises for this. So when we look at strengthening up the tendon again and changing the structure of the tendon to cope with your exercise load, um, that article that you can see referenced there has a very clever way of where they, they divide things into four stages. Whereas your first stage is usually just about getting your pain levels under control. Second stage, you start proper strength training. Third stage, you add in energy loading activities that loads the, the tendon quite quickly with high loads, like you would do in sport. Fourth stage, you then replace that one with um, sport specific stuff. So let's go through each stage at the beginning, um, one by one. So during stage one, it's all about pain management. An isometric exercise for your quadriceps ex, uh, muscle has been shown to be really effective for this. So an isometric exercise is where you contract your, your um, quad muscle, but you don't actually get any movement. So there are several ways that you can do it. Um, let me show you a nice one. The Spanish squat is one of them where you can see the guy has got a band that is fixed to something that won't move. Please don't fix it around something that can move and is leaning back into a static squat. But you'll also notice he's not squatting to 90 degrees. He's at about 60 degrees. And that's because you've got to go in the range that's most comfortable for the tendon. And you may find if you go to 90 degrees, that's just too much force at this point. So you want to sit back in a position that's not uncomfortable and you want to hold that position isometrically. So you're not moving up and down, you're just holding it. And what the research is suggesting is that you want to hold it for about 45 seconds, then you rest for two minutes. And that's important because during those two minutes, loads of things are replacing their energy systems and things in your body. So you need the rest period, but then you repeat that five times. That counts as one exercise bout. And you can do that two to three times in one day. So that's the exercise you usually start with. Now, other ways of doing isometric contractions, you don't have to do that one, is um, 
If you've got a gym in your house, you could probably do that every day with the knee extension machine. I find that a bit impractical or unpractical because we can't all access that on a daily basis. So you can also just do it by pushing with your foot against a wall or a bed that won't move. So let me show you how that works. Um, I'm going to use the bed in this room. Let me just decide which way I turn this. There we go. And I'm actually going to switch this picture off for a moment. Okay, so <clears throat> if you can see my leg there, yes. So what I'll do is I'm sitting comfortably on the chair. Again, you'll notice that my leg isn't fully straight. It's not fully bent. It's kind of halfway in the middle because that's often the most comfortable for the patella tendon when it's really flared up. And all I'm doing is I'm pushing up with my foot against the bed or you can push like that. So I'm, I can feel my quad muscle tensing and I'm pushing as hard as I can. Or no, that's a lie. I'm pushing rather hard um, and I'm just holding the position. And I want to correct myself on that where I said I'm pushing as hard as I can because that's often actually where patients make the mistake. Um, if that tendon is really inflamed or it doesn't have inflammation in it, but really sore, irritated and sore, then if you're going to go and push as hard as you, you can with these isometric exercises, you may actually make it feel worse because it may just be too much for the tendon. So what I tend to start my patients with is that they ease into it. So I'll tell them a guide that I use is I say to them that if you can imagine if you push as hard as you can against that wall, that's 100%. Now, can you bring it back to 50% for me? So start with pushing at 50% intensity and hold it for about 45 seconds and do your five reps with two minutes rest in between. Now, if the tendon tolerates that, we want to bring the loads up that you press eventually at nearly 100% intensity. But how you get there will depend on how your tendon responds. Because the research has shown that if you can do it at 70% of max contraction, that's about where, where you want to get the best pain um, relief from it. Now, how long this phase or stage one lasts depend on different people's um, tendons and where they're at. So for some people, it may last only a couple of weeks. For others, it may last quite a long period of time. It depends on you, it depends on how your therapist sees it best to progress things. So there's not a clear cut thing for that. Let me just make sure I haven't forgotten anything there. Oh yes. So interestingly enough, the reason that they think this works for pain management for the quads or for the patella tendon is that when you've had pain for a long time, the brain starts to think differently about that injured body part and it actually switches the, the quads off. And what they've shown with these isometric exercises is that it activates that pathway from the brain to the quads again, that you get a better neural activation. So that's just for those of you who's interested in that. Now, stage two, as soon as the pain is at a manageable level, it's not going to be gone. It's going to be about three out of 10 level. Then we can usually start introducing strength training. Now, yes, you may have heard that, um, you should do uh, eccentric strength training and should do heavy strength training for this. That is all true, but you can't just jump in with that because you will likely make your tendon feel worse. You've got to build up to things. Also, doing purely eccentric training for this type of condition is actually old news. The first studies where they looked at exercise for patella tendinopathy, yes, they used on that block that I've just shown you, the decline block. This was the um, <clears throat> the exercise that everybody shouted about uh, a few years back but now what they've shown is that actually an exercise program that just uses um, progressive increase in weights so you start with a 15 rep max weight so that means a weight that makes you tired after 15 repetitions and you over time this can take three months this can take more than a year to get there you build it up to working with heavy weights that only allows you about six to eight repetitions before it's tired. Um, works better than these decline squats. And the exercises you use during these, the simplest to start with, and that's also recommended in that article, is just things like the leg press machine 
or the knee extension machine in the gym. And you may want to, again, limit the range of movement you work through because it may hurt if you do the full range of movement. So you have to start within just a small range of movement. So in essence, yes, we have to do heavy um, training with this, but you've got to start with whatever load the tendon is happy with. But you can't just stay on that load. You again have to progress it um, over time. So again, at the moment, the recommendation is about how often to do this is that you want to do high load day, which is the heavier training, and a low load day, which is your isometrics. And you just alternate those. But for some of my patients, I have to actually add in a rest day into that as well to just allow the tendons to adapt a bit more. So again, it's not a hard, fast rule and you've got to adapt it to the patient in front of you. Um, what am I leaving out? Oh yes, important. So leg press, we all tend to do double legs. Squats, we tend to do double legs. Um, even knee extensions often. But the problem is it's quite easy to compensate and do more with a good leg. So what I tend to do with my patients is I start them off with double leg that they get used to the exercise and they get a feel for it and we get a feel for how strong things are. But then you have to move on to doing these exercises with one leg only, that you isolate the injured um, leg and make sure that it gets proper training and that tendon and muscle really works because that's the only way that you can, tend, you can change the structure of the tendon itself. Remember, exercise um, stimulates the body to rebuild things stronger. Passive treatments like massage, acupuncture, things like that can make it feel better for a bit because it helps with pain, but it doesn't um, change the structure of the tendon. You have to do exercise and eventually heavy exercises to change that structure. <clears throat> what am I leaving out? I think that's pretty much it for the strength training stage. So this stage two is actually going to carry on forever and ever and ever because even once you're back to full sport if you want to prevent this injury from coming back you have to do at least two strength training sessions a week and keep this up okay so remember that um, how many repetitions and what weights you work with will change because of that but a therapist or a, um, a rehab therapist or a physiotherapist should be able to assist you with that okay then once you reach certain targets, so once the um, tendon has reached a certain load capacity that it can cope with, and it's usually when you're able to cope with weights that allows you only eight repetitions. So we talk about eight repetition max weights. So uh, a weight that's so heavy, you can only do eight repetitions. You can't actually do a ninth one because your muscle is too tired. Once you can consistently train with that, um, that type of weight, you may be ready to start jumping type activities, um, activities that loads the tendon at um, speed. We call them energy storing activities because when you jump and you land and you release the energy again. But just because you can handle that weight doesn't mean you're going to handle a massive plyometric session. So you've got to test that as well. And we usually tend to start with um, shallow jumps, double leg jumps, simple movements. But as you get better with that, you have to incorporate deeper jumps and um, jumps at angles and different types of movements, as well as sprinting movements and stopping from sprinting, because that's a lot of load there as well. What type of sport you do will dictate what type of movements you add into this phase. Now, even though you may not think, when I talk about heavy weights, people always think, oh, that's the heavy exercise. But actually, all these jumping exercises <clears throat> is much harder work for the or, or loads the tendon a lot more than the heavy weights. So these stage three exercises are now seen as your highest load and how you schedule them into your week. The recommendation at the moment is to do a high load day, which is your stage three, your plyometric exercises, then have an easy low load day, which is your isometrics. Then do a medium load day, which will be your strength training with your heavier weights, and then you can have a rest day. Now, for some people, this rest day may have to be an active day, that it's again an uh, isometric day or it's some activity, because they don't often do that well if they just don't do anything. Other people may need a few more rest days in their weeks before they repeat that cycle. So again, 
It's no one size fits all. You've got to find what works best for your tendon. And all the time when you do these things, you keep on repeating that pain provocation test that you've established for yourself the day after you've trained to see are my pain levels staying at the same level or improving after my session 24 hours ago? If the answer is, yep, feels the same as it did 24 hours ago, then that session was fine. If, however, it's a lot more uncomfortable than what it was before you did that session the previous day, then actually that session was too much. You may have to adapt it the next time. But again, a physio can help you decide all of these things and keep on, help allow you to monitor that properly. Um, Okay, so then what we've got now in your training week at this stage, and this stage may now be three, four months after you first start treatment, or it may be more than a year after you first developed your symptoms. It depends on your tendon. Then once you've achieved a level with these exercises, the, the um, energy loading, the jumping type things, that's relative to what you need to be doing in your sport, you start to transition back to your normal sport. And at this point, you leave the jumping exercises because the sport is now going to replace them. And if you do both, you may just end up overloading your tendon again. So you keep your, your strength training exercises with the weights. You keep your isometric exercises if they're still useful for you. Um, but you start replacing the plyometrics with your sport. And try not to do more than two or three sessions of your sport in a week especially at the beginning because that is a lot more load again and you want the tendon to adapt properly it can take up to 72 hours for the tendon to adapt after an exercise session and that's again why you need to look at your tendon and how it feels very well so that's the bit about exercise and in broad spectrum how you structure this um, rehab program for this type of tendinopathy and this is not something that happens in a couple of months. This is something that's spread over a year or more. Um, and you have to hit certain targets before you move on to things and all the time monitoring your progress to make sure that you're not overloading it with the rehab exercises. Once you're back to full sport, like I said, you've got to keep up your strength training because otherwise you can get this injury recurring again. There are other things you need to look at because there's some, some um, evidence in the research that <clears throat> decreased flexibility in your hamstring and your hip flexors or your quadricep muscles can actually predispose you to this condition. There's also some evidence that seems to suggest that decreased dorsiflexion, so stiff ankles, can contribute to you developing this. Um, strength de deficits in your calf muscles, your glute muscles, as well as your hamstring muscles and your quads, all of them has to be addressed. And then also your jumping and landing mechanics, because it may be that you have poor landing mechanics and that's caused part of the reason why you overloaded your patella tendon. So again, somebody who's skilled in looking at all of these mechanisms can help you with this. And it's as easy as videoing yourself when you're doing it or doing it in front of a video call for somebody to look at it and say, okay, we need to change this and this and this. Um, now, it may feel that you're doing everything that you should be doing, but it's still not getting better. And there are certain reasons why this may be. The first thing I want you to check is, are you expecting this to improve too quickly? So remember, 50% of patients will not get back to full sport within a year. Um, so this is not a condition where you can see quick gains. And it's really important that you monitor and make um, a point of writing down everything you do in a week because then you can see the small improvements and when you feel despondent that it's not getting better but you look back at a month or two months ago you'll see oh no actually I still have pain and discomfort but I can now do this much where at that point I can do only that I could only do that much so that's a massive improvement and a sign that your tendons capacity to cope with load is getting better so I know that it's really hard to stay motivated when you still have a niggle and you still have pain, but try to keep perspective about how much more you can do now before that niggle kicks in, or even with that niggle, how much more you're able to do without aggravating it further. The other thing that you may be going wrong with is if you've got certain races and things booked 
and you're trying to push your rehab too quickly. So you're actually overloading your tendon through the exercises you're doing. You have to pitch the rehab exercises at the right level for the capacity of that tendon. You can't just jump into heavy things because you've heard that you've got to do heavy things. Heavy is relative to what the tendon can go, not to what you think is hard work. Okay. Um, yep, that's kind of hand in hand with not follow, following the right rehab program. Then also if you're not addressing the other issues in the body. So if you're not strengthening your calves or your glutes and things that needs to help propel you forwards when you're running, it may still be that you're overloading the quads and the tendon. Um, <clears throat> there are other conditions like inflammatory diseases that can cause trouble in tendons. So it's worth, if you've got a history of inflammatory disease in the family, it's worth having your blood tested for that and um, having somebody check that. Then it could be a misdiagnosis. So remember all the other signs that I talked about before this that can feel similar to this, so bursitis and fat pad irritation and stuff. Um, if you've not seen somebody to have this diagnosed, it may be time to get a scan on it and just make sure that the diagnosis diagnosis is correct. <clears throat> and then lastly, fear can actually stand in your way. So when you've got something that's really, really painful and you know that it's a condition that can get worse, it's very hard not to be frightened of irritating it. But the problem is being fearful of movement and being terrified or frightened that you will make things worse can actually make your pain worse. And the reason for this is that pain is mainly created in the brain. And this does not mean that your pain is all in your head. It's just that the brain is bombarded the whole day with signals from all over the body. And we don't actually have pain receptors in our body. We've got, we've got receptors that tells the brain about um, chemicals in different tissues, about um, pressure in different tissues. When you've had pain that's ongoing, those um, receptors actually trigger more easily. It fires off at things that shouldn't be fired off. The brain starts to worry about that injury. So the more dangerous the brain perceives that injury to be to you, the more it creates pain and the more easily it creates pain. So a good example of this is if I press my thumb like this, it doesn't hurt. Now, if I whack it with a hammer and then I press my thumb, even gently, it will hurt. Now, you can agree that me pressing that very gently is not doing any damage and it shouldn't actually be hurting. It's just because this is now oversensitive from hitting it with a hammer. So that's the same concept. All the nerve endings and things become really sensitive in that tendon. So now it's super sensitive to any pressure, super sensitive to any stretch. And things that shouldn't be causing you pain and doesn't actually cause any damage is causing you pain. So that's another reason why it can be useful to work with an experienced th therapist because they can reassure you um, when you report to them about certain things that causes discomfort and stuff. They can reassure you about what level of discomfort and pain is okay and what level you should watch out for and when you can push things a bit and when you should hold back. Um, like for instance, there's good evidence to show that it's okay to feel discomfort while you do your exercises. The main thing is that you don't want that discomfort or increase in discomfort to last for longer than 24 hours. If it does, then that's a level that we're not happy with. Then we've got to dial down your training a bit. But if it just stays at the same level, then it's not a problem. So. Think about it, and if you're not getting help with this at the moment, then please go and seek help from somebody who's got experience. Now, let me know if you've got any questions, and if you need more help with your injury, you're always welcome to consult me via video call. Take care.